Sir Angus, thanks for joining us and congratulations. How's that Sir title sitting with you so far? Uh, thanks, Joe. Um, I'm still uh, still getting uh, used to uh, being uh, Sir Angus, if you like. Um, let me uh, assure you that I, I haven't changed, I won't change, uh, and I will remain Angus to uh, everybody who uses that address uh, in the current circumstances. <laughs> okay, so on Australia Day, how does it feel being chosen as one of the very few people this nation recognises at the highest level? Well, it's a, it's a great honour um, to be... Uh, uh, to be selected for this award at this time um, is a great surprise to me. I'm deeply humbled by it uh, and I would say very quickly that uh, everything I have achieved has been achieved uh, with the great support of thousands and thousands of uh, other Australians, people uh, who work for me in the uh, Australian Defence Force and in more recent times the people that I worked with and for uh, in a variety of uh, causes. Uh, we obviously have the two Malaysian disasters, but I'm also involved in a, a wide number of other activities, uh, Chair of Air Services Australia, uh, Chair of uh, the Advisory Board to the South Australian Government, and also Chair of the Victorian Police Advisory Board. So I've been very lucky to uh, work very closely with some wonderful people, uh, and to a large extent, um, you know, everything that I've achieved uh, has been with their assistance. Without them, uh, I wouldn't have achieved anything. Now, I want to go back a few years. I was surprised to see that you migrated to Australia from Scotland when you were 21 because I've never noticed any accent with you. Why did you make that decision to come to Australia back then? Well, it was actually at age 20, and the uh, reason, reason I came, um, my big ambition was to join the uh, Royal Air Force, and they told me I was too tall. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that was on the basis of getting into an aircraft. I'd passed all the tests, and they said, one last thing, you're very tall, we just need to uh, size you up in the, uh, the aircraft you will fly. I got into it, and uh, it looked like I was far too tall. Uh, but the person who was administering the uh, check didn't realise uh, that the uh, ejection seat uh, at rest is left in the fully up position. Uh, had he lowered the handle, or I'd lowered the handle, uh, life might have been completely different for me. <laughs> well, it was Australia's gain, I guess. So uh, why, were my you good luck. <laughs> why were you so passionate about a career in the military? Well, my father was... Uh, uh, an officer in the uh, Royal Air Force. He was a World War II fighter pilot. He flew typhoons. Uh, he was shot down after 60 operational missions, incarcerated in the Great Escape Camp. And I guess I grew up uh, in a uh, service family. We moved every two years. Uh, my father was uh, a pilot, a very good one, and uh, he commanded squadrons. And uh, I was attracted to uh, uh, that that sort of life, yeah. and and in Australia they had no height restriction, <laughs> no height restrictions on pilots. Well, when I was measured, um, I I didn't stretch out. I just uh... <laughs> so you cheated. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> I actually, uh, as I found out, uh, there's no problem with the ejection seat. Right. Uh, I could fly those no trouble at all, and indeed, uh, flew ejection seats uh, uh, often through my career. OK, so you're in the armed forces for several decades. This is a poignant year for the armed services with the centenary of Gallipoli. What's the significance of that for you? Well, I, I think uh, Gallipoli is uh, incredibly important to us. Um, I guess uh, Gallipoli was the, uh, the first time um, we came together as a nation. Um, it was the first time uh, Victorians, New South Welshmen, uh, uh, West Australians, South Australians, um, Queenslanders, Tasmanians all work together uh, to common purpose in a very challenging set of circumstances. It was really our first test as a nation and I think the, uh, the way the, uh, uh, the soldiers behaved uh, in the most extraordinarily challenging uh, conditions uh, is something that we should always remember 
uh, remember their great sacrifice, but also remember the, uh, the values they demonstrated in very challenging circumstances. Uh, and this is something that we, uh, we all inherit and something that we should be um, very proud of. Yeah. Since you retired from the military, you've worked on the Australian response, as you mentioned before, to the MH370 and 17 tragedies. There are families still seeking answers. What sense of duty do you have to them? And the search continues for MH370, does it? And you're still involved in that? Well, no, I'm not, I'm not uh, directly involved right. at, at this time. But let, let me just say, I think that the, uh, the families are, uh, are first and foremost in everybody's minds. Um, I think if we look at MH17, our whole focus was on recovering uh, the remains of uh, our Australians who were victims of that terrible uh, criminal act. Uh, and secondly, in terms of those that were lost uh, on MH370, uh, we have a, uh, a very strong duty to go out and find those uh, people and find uh, MH370. And I think everything that's being done right now by the uh, Australian um, Transportation Safety Board uh, is, uh, is very laudable. The work that's being done by the, uh, the contractors offshore uh, in terms of searching with underwater towed vehicles hopefully will uh, eventually give us a, a good outcome. Um, it could be a while. Nothing happens fast underwater. Uh, but I'm very confident that the ATSB and the contractors that they have employed, uh, together with our Malaysian friends, uh, will give uh, a, a very good effort uh, at finding MH370. And I'm still hopeful and uh, quietly uh, optimistic uh, that we might find it. Mm. And how do you intend to use this recognition in relation to causes close to your heart over the coming years? Well, I'm, uh, I'm very passionate about a number of uh, charities and uh, I, will, I will continue to do what I've been doing for the last, uh, the last few years. I'll continue to work hard uh, to support those charities. Uh, and I don't think it matters whether I'm uh, Angus or Sir Angus, um, it, will give, uh, it will give those charities uh, uh, my full support. Mm. And there's a bit of discussion today around your fellow new knights. You're in some royal company there. Yes, I'm, I'm a great admirer of uh, um, the Duke of Edinburgh. Uh, I think the Duke of Edinburgh scheme is one that has uh, probably been more successful than any other scheme. Uh, in recent years in terms of uh, helping the development of young people. Uh, and I think a lot of the things that the Duke has been involved in uh, for many, many years uh, demonstrate an incredible commitment by him uh, in terms of uh, causes that uh, not only uh, affect the British people but also affect the people of the Commonwealth. Mm. And I hold him in very deep respect uh, for the, uh, the decades of service that he has given uh, the United Kingdom and, uh, and the Commonwealth. And Sir Angus, how do you plan to spend the, re the rest of your Australia Day today? Does a stir Sir still have a barbie every now and then? Look, I got up this morning. Uh, I'm still uh, Angus. I got on my running shoes. Uh, I did a 10k run. Um, 10 k uh, <laughs> Over the hills of uh, Canberra and uh, I enjoyed it immensely and I'll continue to, uh, to do that sort of thing. And uh, today, later today, I will spend some uh, quality time with my family uh, and I really look forward to that. Yeah, and I guess uh, on, on runs like that, if you do 10Ks around Canberra, you get a real sense of um, uh, the beauty of this country. Unfortunately, we've got to leave it there, but thanks so much for talking to us today, Sir Angus Houston. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much, and, uh, and um, I hope you have a good Australia Day. Thank you very much.